Hello and welcome here to our booth at the OP conference in Munich. We as ISAQB strive to empower IT professionals and teams by shaping the future with our certifications and trainings for software architects. Meetings and events are very important to gain new insights and to share the latest ideas being discussed in the software architecture community. In this video, we meet some of the brightest minds here at the OP conference in Munich. Stay tuned for exclusive interviews with leading experts. And I'm here together with Andrew Harmelor. He's tech principal at ThoughtWorks, and uh, he's also of the recently published book, Facilitating Software Architecture. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's really exciting. In your book, you discuss the evolving role of software architects. How is this role changing and what does it mean for teams today? What's happening at the moment is there's more software architecture happening and more software architecture needs to happen. And at the same time, the traditional role of software architect, the, the, the people with the, the, the word in their job title are becoming more and more stressed in my experience, trying to be in all of the right places at all the right times, doing the required architecture. So what I see is, happening and that you can hear it in the title of the book. In order for the right amount of architecture to be done in the right way, in the right places at the right times, the people with the word architect in their title are more and more facilitating the process of architecture within teams and across different um, roles to make sure that the right people have the skills so they're building up their, their skills and learning. So there was more architects or more architecture happening, maybe for the same number of architects. And so therefore you're getting a better end result, you're getting more sustainable products, you're getting uh, systems that can evolve and grow and change with the changing needs of the market and things. So it's, it's a really interesting time to be a software architect or be somebody working in software which is involved with architecture. You emphasize collaboration between architects and development teams. What are some practical strategies you have found effective in fostering this collaboration? So it's another great question. The thing that I've learned most is, number one is to be aware of the kind of implicit hierarchy. We have this thing where architect feels like a senior role, like a, like a role that someone would play if they've been around and they've been a developer and now they've progressed to an architecture. And being aware of that and being aware of the fact that that might impact how you work with, with your colleagues and coworkers is super important. So being aware of that and then using kind of working with that, that uh, the sense of um, hierarchy, maybe breaking down the sense of hierarchy to make sure that the right people are involved in the right way, the right people feel included enough and safe enough to, to participate. So one of the key things that I've learned that I've been, been trying to kind of teach people and lots of my clients is something I got from Diana Montalian, and that's metacognition. So being aware of your thinking. So not just thinking and doing the thinking, but also being aware of it, being able to explain why I think something, to be able to explain why this is important, why I learned this lesson in the past, and, and not just do software architecture, but explain what I'm doing when I'm doing it. So therefore the people that I'm doing it with, they can learn and they can become um, able to do architecture as well. So that's the most, one of the most super important things. And then the participation increases and the practice of architecture grows and becomes more broad as opposed to just something that's done by certain people. Your book introduces various techniques to empower teams in making architectural decisions. Could you share one or two techniques that readers might find particularly impactful? So I've got a great one. The best one, which, so this comes from Don Reinertsen, who wrote the Principles of Product Development Flow, and lots of the inspiration for what I talk about in the book comes from that book. And what Don Reinertsen talks about, and he's talking about product decisions, but it's the same thing for architecture. He says, uh, fast and wrong is better than slow and correct, which is typically the complete opposite of what people who have the word architect in their job title think about because they think, oh, we do a really big job and we think really hard and we deliberate for as long as we need to and we can make the perfect decision. And Don Reinertsen points out that the perfect decision, which is too late or too large or too slow, is not the perfect decision. It's far better to make a small decision rapidly and then put it into production just like we do with all other pieces of software and learn and get the feedback because you don't know if something is a good decision until you've actually put it into production. So that's it, so make a small decision rapidly get it into code, get it deployed, 
and get it being used. And then you know if it's good. So if it's good, then you keep going. If it's bad, then you back it out. So that's very, very opposite to what many people have grown up, like architects like me have grown up thinking. When you're aware of your thinking, you're aware that you, you're tending towards making big decisions, you can catch that, move into small decisions, facilitate the teams to make small decisions, and you get a far better result as a, as a consequence. So that's, that's the one trick that I, that I push for more than anything else. Andrew, thank you for your insights. Thank you for having me. As you can see, many training providers and companies are present to showcase their capabilities and to discuss future trends. Within the ISAQB community, we connect international professionals from all fields of the industry. Our curricula are based on the knowledge and the skills achieved by the members of our international community. And one of these companies is Embark. I'm here with Stefan Todt. Stefan is a long-standing ISAQB member and you are part of the Strategic Council and also a curator for the CBSA Advanced Modules, HL Software Architecture and Architecture Evaluation. You are also one of the founders and CEO of Embark. Your company is specialized in software architecture consulting. Stefan, great to have you here. Thank you, Maker. What does your role as ISAQB curator involve and how does it shape the software architecture education? Well, as an ISAQB curator, you're responsible for a curriculum. Um, we have several advanced curricula, um, and one of them is for domain-driven design, the other one is for HL architecture, another one is for architecture evaluations, and the last two, as you mentioned, are two that I'm responsible for. Responsible means that I look after the module, so I keep it uh, up to date. Um, I listen to suggestions from the community. Um, I try to incorporate them into a uh, a good body of knowledge um, that's surrounding the topic um, and I'm also um, working hand in hand with the audit group to actually accredit uh, new training providers and new trainers uh, for these modules. What motivates you uh, to contribute uh, to the development of the ISQB curricula? Well, it's uh, lots of different factors, I think. The, the one factor that is very important for me is that software architecture is an important topic for me. Um, so I work uh, with people that are software architects, that are developers out there, and I see what perhaps is lacking um, out there at knowledge-wise and, 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 and practice-wise. Uh, and this is something that I can contribute into the uh, ISQB and discuss there with other experts. Um, and it's actually quite rewarding. In your opinion, how has the role of software architects evolved in recent years and what key skills do you believe are essential for architects today? Well, evolution is, is long lasting, I would think. That the first time we talked about software architects, we imagined some grey-haired people in a, in a room doing planning stuff and then just communicating the plans to other people that are actually implementing them. Um, today, um, we talk about uh, uh, interconnection and, and, and collaboration that's surrounding architecture. And to actually have this collaborative architecture inside an agile team, inside a development team, um, is uh, something that needs practice, something that needs methods, um, and of course, technologies. And this is all stuff that is in the advanced curricula. And I think um, this, this change is very obvious uh, when you look at the advanced curricula that we have. And in your opinion, um, what is the advantage of the ISAQB curricula in comparison maybe to other systems of education in software architecture? Well, first and foremost, uh, I think the ISAQB is, is not a vendor of something. It's a non-profit organization that is built out of experts uh, that, that try to uh, make the field interesting for others, that try to have all the important topics uh, discussed in, in, in one place. And other architecture certificates perhaps are more geared towards a certain tool, uh, towards a certain environment, uh, stuff like this, and um, the ISQB doesn't have that. So it's a neutral um, conglomerate of experts, um, and I think that's, that's pretty unique. As ISAQB, we encourage community building and promote diversity of people and ideas because sharing knowledge between teams and organizations is key to success and future innovation. And now we are sitting here with Jean Verschatze. She's speaker at the OP conference in Munich. 
you are a consultant and software engineer at 8 Point Squared and uh, you are specialized in software architecture and domain modeling. Great to have you here and uh, you I'd like to ask me. you something about it. Yes. Your session focuses uh, on bridging the socio-technical gaps in software architecture. What are the most common gaps you see in organizations today and how can they be addressed? So I think we have a, a few uh, gaps there. Uh, first, if you look um, within a team, uh, one thing I notice is skill gaps. Eh? Um, so architects make decisions on which technologies to use and which methodologies uh, to use. But what they don't do is actually train the, the people. Uh, they don't provide time during office hours to actually get these people up to speed with all these new technologies and new methodologies. Eh? So that's one of the things um, I've noticed. The second gap I have noticed is sort of between business and IT. Eh? Uh, business thinks that if they talk to one person and then it gets handed over, and hand it over and hand it over, it, they'll somehow get good software, which is often not the case. And then the business is like, well, the IT teams never do what we actually want them to do. But it's like, yes, it's because there's a, a, a giant space between the person who actually has to program it and you with the IDs and the requirements. So we have to bring that uh, closer together. And I think the third one I have noticed uh, in most, uh, most of my clients is the fact that you have a, a business strategy, um, there's a future plan on, on where a company uh, wants to go. And if you then look at the software strategy, it does not really uh, line up. Eh? I'm going to give an example of that. Uh, I went to a team and they said our main focus for this year is to refactor our current uh, software. And then when I, I went to talk to the CTO and the CEOs um, and they were like, well, we want to create new products. Eh? And so the main focus of the year was to improve the current product, eh? get better quality in the code. But actually for the next few years, that wasn't the focus of the company at all. Eh? So there's a, a mismatch there uh, severely. So those are a bit the three most important things I have noticed when I go to clients. In your experience, uh, what role does communication play in successful software architecture and what practical steps can architects take to improve collaboration across teams? Yeah. I think communication is, is everything. Most of what I've seen when sort of features get delivered and they're not what they're supposed to be is due to miscommunication. Language is a very confusing thing. Yeah, people are also very confusing. I remember when I was a software developer, it was like the, the technical parts were fine. It was the people that was difficult. For me, that was that was hard, uh, getting to understand them and how why they reacted the way they reacted. Eh? And I think an architect can play a very central role because eh? they're on a higher level in the software system, and they sort of need to understand how the business functions and where the company wants to go to in the next few years so that the system can follow. Eh? And I think by using something like uh, collaborative modeling, eh? where they they bring uh, the business and uh, the the software developers and, and of user researchers, UX designers, anything closer together, if they put them all in, a, in the same room, there's less chance of miscommunication. Eh? Or there's a, a better opportunity to say, I actually don't really understand what you're talking about um, at this point. Eh? So that's what I use to sort of uh, make all of this better. I use uh, collaborative modeling techniques such as event storming, example mapping. Uh, for uh, higher management, I have the business model canvas and all those tools a very visual uh, so there's no uh, communication and we can have a focus on on what we're actually talking about so you talked about uh, three four things what holding teams back from successful delivering uh, software yeah there's one thing i have noticed and it's that um, teams are not responsible from um, id to pushing to production if you really want to be successful you have to sort of be responsible for that entire cycle but if i look at larger companies mostly enterprises for example even they try to scale up, they do things like, you know what, um, we'll create uh, some a team that's responsible for the databases and for the cloud and all of that. And so if they want to push to production, they have to go to those teams. If they want to change something, they want to have to go to those teams. And so actually just being able to be responsible for that entire stream from ID to production of whatever microservice, whatever inside your microservice, uh, really helps you to speed up. 
So if you look at the, the companies, you have some sort of architect or you have higher management that's not really involved in the day-to-day -day handlings and they sort of decide these type of things. Um, and even when the teams complain that, hey, this is not the most efficient way for us to go about, we can't actually uh, go fast that way, um, they have a very hard time convincing those people because they look at it, they look at it from a cost saving perspective and they say if we can centralize anything to do with databases, that will save us a lot of money. Okay? Um, and that's why they do it. But if you look at how can a team push to production fast, that actually creates extra communication between teams and all of that, so that slows them down. And for me, it's mostly because they look at things very differently uh, in higher management than what uh, software development teams look at. Yeah. Thank you for your time and check out our social media. We offer latest news, insights and exclusive interviews with industry-leading experts. Don't miss out and subscribe to ISAQB on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Mastodon and Blue Sky. See you next time.